Hi, I'm Albert Pasawa. Hello, my name is Kevin Jeffries. And this is the 635 Podcast. The 635 Podcast is about local politics, economics, and social and cultural issues in the Alvin Community College area. The views expressed on the show are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of Alvin Community College. Welcome to the 635 Podcast. Um, I'm your host, Albert Pasawa, and there's Kevin Jeffries right across from me. Hello, Albert. What's up? What's going on in the news? Lots of things. Lots of things. What I have been following recently, um, locally anyway, you know that I'm interested in the uh, laws pertaining to economic development in the area up and down 288 and uh, how that is proceeding. So I've been following a little bit of information from the Economic Development Alliance for Brazoria County. There's also, and this is something our competitors a little bit further south, Brazoria, Brazosport College does. They have economic indicators, which might be an interesting thing for us to look at, to see how the county overall is doing in terms of the economy. Mm. And there seems to be a very different picture, whether or not you're talking about south and whether you're talking about north, because up here, of course, as we know, everything is exploding. South, what do you mean? What south compared to what? Angleton, Lake Jackson, Freeport, Surfside, all of that, everything that's connected to the um, the, um, uh, plants uh, down there, petrochemical, Dow, things of that nature. And up here, of course, you know, you see a lot of economic development in terms of the subdivisions. Manville, of course, is going crazy. Uh, I think we discussed a little bit last time the... uh, Construction going on with Manville Town Center. And of course, about 10 years ago, you had a similar sort of thing with Perlin Town Center, which is a fascinating dynamic. These cities are kind of forming themselves in ways because Manville traditionally seems like, you know, stuff on either side of Highway 6, but now it's becoming more of an actual city. And you've got the Manville Economic Development Corporation uh, that's uh, spearheading a bunch of these things. It strikes me more of a, maybe a bedroom community, but that's just me driving through and teaching there. Um, or is it becoming sort of a shopping destination? At least that's my perception of Pearland uh, when I go out there. I think Manville would like to see that. That's something we could talk about at some point, maybe bring some individuals that we know uh, that are involved in this. And that certainly is what the Manville Town Center is attempting to do as well too and I I have a few things that I've been looking at too in terms of where Manville was about five six seven years ago in terms of expanding its extra territorial annexation taking advantage of its extra extra territorial jurisdiction luring companies to develop some of these uh, um, uh, these communities that we see propping up I was especially looking at Meridiana recently something called Rise Communities has been responsible for that as well that's a housing development uh, yes, yes, yes. The one that I think is mostly on the south side of six and also heading into Iowa Colony. As is that well. right across from Manville High School? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. In fact, if you've seen over time, and I haven't taken this as of yet, but the, uh, the, the, the bridge that's been built that's going on on the other side of Highway 6 and heading off, of course, to Freedom Field, where mm-hmm. we've had uh, some of our more recent... Uh, 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 ceremonies and whatnot here, graduation ceremonies. And I, I also stumbled across some things that dealt a little bit more specifically with the bonds associated with Freedom Field, and I think that might be an interesting thing to look oh, at so as well, so you mean too. somebody borrowed money to build Well, that's that how year. you do it. That's how we do it, right? You know, we uh, the voters of the particular district, in this case the Alvin Independent School District, approves bonds to be sold. And I can't remember if this was a unique one or if it was something that was passed, which I believe it was, uh, to build other campuses as well. Uh, it was a $40 million stadium. And remember, that's part of what's happening here. You had these different sorts of developments occurring, and it's like the local governments have to keep up. You know, uh, Alvin Independent School District has to say, okay, well, we have, we're going to have this much need that's projected in terms of uh, families. How many are we going to get? How many elementary schools do we need? How many junior colleges? Do, uh, I'm sorry, junior high schools do we need? Do we need another high school? And, of course, we got... Uh, Iowa Colony High School going up right now. Uh, I don't even know if it's finished. Um, I yeah, I, I know there's classes slated to start there. So well, there you go. Something. And it's probably not big enough. <laughs> that was the story, of course, with Manville High School. I think I mentioned that last time we were talking about this. The minute it was done, it was too small. Mm. So they went on to other things as well, too. Shadow Creek, for example, which is a great high school, by the way. 
That's where I'm doing my dual credit stuff, and I just love that place. It's it's really cool. Yeah, it reminded me of a of like a modern shopping mall, of like the two stories, or yeah, you know, you're walking into this main area, and then you could look up. The students are super cool. The people who work there are super cool. They're very laid back. Um, other places are a little bit more tense, uh, but I, I especially like that. But anyway, uh, the local area enticed uh, a developer to move here to focus primarily on that, and I think that's the same kind of story with the people who developed Shadow Creek as well, which continues, you know. Um, also, one of the things I was getting into, and I don't think we'll do it right now necessarily, but I'm kind of into the public notices that you'll see on some of the uh, um, newspapers. Let me randomly pick up one All that right. I was looking at that I thought was kind of fun. Um, Okay, disaster, debris, reduction, hauling, and removal. This is from the Brazosport Facts. Sealed proposals are due at 2 p.m. on Monday, February 7, 2022, after which time all qualified proposals will be open and publicly read aloud at City Hall, blah, blah, blah. So if you want to get a, a uh, present a bid, a sealed bid to uh, get rid of some debris, haul and remove it, well, there's an opportunity for you to get into that sort of thing. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so they post a list of here's some junk who wants to take it and well it's a variety of things you know uh, it's one of the things that uh, a lot of different um, newspapers will do uh, here's another one sealed RFPs request for proposals for 2228 vegetative control services will be received by Brazoria County Purchasing Director Susan Serrano Brazoria County Court West Annex Building Purchasing Department. So vegetative control. I don't know what vegetables they're trying to control. Maybe some, uh, I don't know, tomatoes are getting rambunctious. Vege when they, are they literally talking about vegetables or vegetative vegetation? Some kind of vegetation is going crazy, you know. Vegetative and so the county, uh, you know, I remember, again, when we're talking about unincorporated areas, uh, the county has to come in and deal with, uh, uh, with those particular issues. As far as other things I've been looking at, there's an interesting story from the Texas Tribune regarding, well, let's say this, how I'm presenting it to my classes is that there can be tension between state officials and local officials when it comes to law enforcement, in this case, especially prosecuting uh, criminal law cases. This is something that specifically in the Texas Constitution, Texas uh, statutory code, gives it to the locally elected district attorney to prosecute criminal law cases, our Attorney General, uh, Ken Paxton, would like to take over or assist in the prosecution of criminal cases involving election uh, law. And the uh, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, I think it was in December, an eight to one decision, said you can't do that. That's a violation of separated powers. I think it's a violation of... Uh, so the state just can't come in and tell them what, to, what they should do? The, specifically the Attorney General. The attorney general's office they can't come in without the request of the local officials mm -hmm. they can't just take over he can't take over and say okay i'm dealing with election law um uh, vi uh accusations of violation of uh election law in the state of texas local governments get to do that but there has been a push by some uh, officials to get them to rethink it so this is an interesting also separated powers issue uh between some executive officials and also the uh um, the judiciary, at least that part of the judiciary and the state level that deals with criminal cases, not civil cases, because that would be the Texas Supreme Court. I've been looking at that. Uh, one thing we might want to get into later on, too, is the uh, candidate. This is from the Chronicle. Candidate filing underway in Brazoria cities near Pearland. I think that would also include Alvin. Uh, people that want to run for the independent school districts of Pearland and Alvin. Uh, you can run if you want. Alvin Community College as well, too. These are all nine-person boards. They serve overlapping six-year terms, and so the terms of three uh, are up. Some people are going to run again. Some people aren't. Some people are you know, holding their cards close mm -hmm. to their chests. And uh, um, I, I, I would like to, at some point, spend a bit more time focusing primarily on that. Now, one interesting case that I'd like to look at, story, from Community Impact News. This is the title. And there's, there's a lot we can jump into with this. Friendswood Independent School District, remember one of our local uh, single-purpose governing districts, thousand of them in the state of Texas, sees jump in college admissions with elimination of class rank. Apparently two years ago, they decided to no longer, I guess three years ago, spring 2019, um, they decided to no longer uh, rank students other than the top 10% because you have to do that. State law says you have to do that because then you're eligible for 
um, automatic admission to public universities. But other than that, you're not ranked. And this has had some interesting positive um, impact, uh, which I'd like to run through. And the other thing I wanted to look at, too, and we were doing this in a previous class as well, the state also wanted to come in and tell us. Now, when I say us here, I'm talking primarily for those of us who teach dual credit. And for listeners, you're probably familiar that Alvin Community College and most other community colleges have relationships with independent school districts where students can take one class mm-hmm. and you knock out the requirement uh, for, the, uh, for high school and also for, uh, for college. So this would apply primarily to the high school side of it, but it's called the Texas 1836 Project, which there was a lot uh, discussed this time last year when it was introduced into the legislature. It was passed into law, and now it's part of our government code. Title IV on the executive branch, subtitle D, History, Culture, and Education, Chapter 451, Texas 1836 Project. Okay, let's dive into, let's focus on one story here. Let's go to that class rank one, uh, which you mentioned. Um, I explained, what, what is this story about? What is it saying? And I'll let's, scroll through it. Here. Let's read a little bit through this. Friendland, Friendswood, sorry, Independent School District is starting to see an increase in college admissions after removing class ranks. You had a class rank. I bet you did pretty well. I had school. a class rank. Uh, it was basically to estimate the number of students there. Um, yeah, I was, uh, let's say, I'm pretty sure I was triple digits. I was, a, I was a terrible high school student. I was a terrible one, too, but there were a lot that were worse <laughs> than me. I went to Galveston Ball way back in the day. I think I was right at the bottom of the first quartile. You know, there were about 700 students, and I think I was around 150 or 140 or something like that. Um, Anyway, so they're they're saying, let's get rid of that. Class rank was removed from the district in spring 2019 after the Board of Trustees voted to remove it from schools. As previously reported by Community Impact Newspaper, there's a link right here to a previous story, so maybe if we have time, we can look at that as well. What was, what was their rationale for a limit? I mean, I could see all sorts of pros and cons. Let's, let's read through this. It mentions this right here. Though Texas law requires schools to report the top 10% of each class for automatic admission to public universities, uh, FISD does not report any rankings outside of that, and obviously the state of Texas doesn't require that you do that. I don't know. What, why, why do we have to rank? Why do you have to know that you are, you know, 450 or 451 or 452? Um, data presented, and this gets to your question, Albert, uh, at the January 24th board workshop showed that students who fell outside of the top 10 percent were admitted to various public universities at a higher percentage than in 2019 before class rank was voted out. So students are doing better without the, the rankings. And, and that raises some interesting questions. What's going on here? Wait, wait, let me, let me clarify here. So, and again, I'm not um, used to sort of the Texas school system. Uh, so if you're the top 10 of your high school, that what, that guarantees you admissions into a public university? Yes, yeah, specifically what are alleged to be the more uh, selective of the top, uh, of the public universities, and primarily that would mean University of Texas and Texas A&M. So the UT and all the branches of UT? I, primarily the uh, Austin and College Station when it comes to Texas A&M. And, and here, here's a little bit from a, you know, a website on uh, Texas House Bill 588 from 1997. Uh, the top 10% rule, the law guarantees Texas students who graduate in the top 10% of their high school class automatic admissions to all state-funded universities. The bill was created as a mean to avoid the stipulations from the Hopwood versus Texas appeals court case banning the use of affirmative action. The argument was that this is a way that you could, you, you could still yeah. get a diverse student body without having to worry about affirmative action because presumably then, you know, you would have some uh, schools that would be predominantly African-American. Or and then Latino. you just take the top 10% of that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I, I don't know the numbers right now, but my understanding is that actually it is relatively, uh, you still have a uh, relative diversity, you know, as, as, as a consequence of this. But let me continue a little bit through the story. Um, through a student survey, a survey, and this is where the information comes from, they're, they're, they're surveying students. Admission by any method to Texas A&M University grew from 2019 to 2020 for students who fell into the second, third, and fourth quartile 
by a large percentage. Now, this, this number seems kind of incredible. For example, only 4% of students in the third and fourth quartile were accepted in Texas A&M in 2019. In 2020, 50% of the students were admitted. So I, I'm, I'm thinking, and, and again, we were talking about this in some previous classes. Let's say that you are in high school and you get the class ranking and you're in the fourth quartile. 600 people in the class, you are number 510. You're probably feeling like you're kind of a little bit of a dummy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not college material because I'm way down here. Well, maybe you are college material. You said you didn't like high school. I didn't either. How, how about college? Oh, in terms of what? In, did you like it better? Oh, yeah. I yeah. loved college. Oh, I I, well, I had to go through, well, there's community college and then yeah. there's university. So yeah. I went through that. So this is talking about um, students who are going directly high school to, to the university. university. It seems to. Here, let me read a little bit more. With the second, third, and fourth quartile, it's already shown that they're accepting those kids even more. So this is, seems like it's a very good policy change on the part of Friendswood Independent School District. And maybe we could discuss with them a bit more about uh, the rash what, what led to this. A survey sent out to the class of 2020 at FISD also showed many students were choosing courses. This is what I think is especially interesting. Mm. Choosing courses based simply on how well it would affect their GPA and class rank. That's yeah. what they were doing in 2020, but notice this. It was merely for rank. So why are you taking certain sorts of classes? Well, yeah. I think it's an easy A. And exactly. that way I can up my, a. but other classes might be more interesting. Say I want to take a physics class. I don't think I'm going to get an A. I think I might be able to pass, but if I pass, I got a C. And what's that going to do to my GPA? It's going to lower it, even though maybe I benefit from that physics class or calculus yeah. or whatever. It was merely for rank. Some of those students will sit down and say, tell me what courses uh, to take to put me in the top 10%. Mm -hmm. Said Kim Cole, uh, Friendswood Independent School District's Executive Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning. She would be wonderful to talk to about this. During the presentation about how students choose their classes. I mean, how did you choose classes when you were in high school? Or did you? <laughs> oh, I, I, I was very passive. I was just like, oh, German sounds interesting. Let me try that. Well, there you go. <laughs> how'd, you do, how'd you do in the German classes? Uh, terrible. Well, but, but, you know, and that could have negatively affected your GPA, but did you get anything kind of positive out of it? Learned yeah, a little bit of German? A, it was a fun experience. Yeah, you know, like... Ich habe kein Geld is one piece of German I know. Well, there you go. There we go. There you go. More than me. That was not... That, by the way, that, it, that should mean I have no money, but uh, <laughs> I, I, we're going to have to go back and check to see what I... I'm pretty sure. Here's the last paragraph right here. For the first phase of looking into changing how GPA is ranked... The recommendation for the board is for schools to calculate rank GPA with core and world language classes as classes only. Personal GPAs would be calculated uh, with all courses. I'm not sure exactly what that part means right there, but it seems like, you know, um, GPA, well, that's GPA. Class rank doesn't really um, help. Maybe it inhibits well, students. Well, class rank is creating perverse incentives for them to study material, which is less challenging. There you to go. get the high rank. Yes. But then, I mean, I'm speculating on what's going on, but then colleges look at that. Mm -hmm. And um, in the case where students stop doing that and maybe their GPA is taking a hit or their ranking is taking a hit, but colleges will still might be impressed that students are taking um, pretty known to be tough courses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, despite having lower ranks, maybe they're looking favorably upon these students. I mean, that's that's basically the hypothesis that they're sort of forwarding in this article. It could it could totally be true. You're less concerned about getting the easy A. I do. I mean, from a point of view of trying to figure out, you know, what's actually going on. I mean, this is a fairly recent phenomena. I mean, that they removed class rank in spring of 2019 and then suddenly students are getting um, are getting accepted at a higher rate. Is that real? I mean, w that, that could be a spurious correlation with any other change. Um, I don't know. I'm, I can't really read the story quickly, but, um, is this story saying the students specifically at Friendswood ISD has seen their college admissions rise while other ISDs who have stuck with the class rank system, have they stayed the same? I don't know. Obviously, I mean, that's, that's an important question. I mean, yeah, if everyone, I mean, I mean, it's not possible for everyone, but, you know, maybe there are other districts that yeah. kept the ranking and they also, so there could be some other factors going on, which we should bear in mind. Um, 
but it's a that's a important hypothesis that somebody needs to look into because um, maybe this class rank thing mm -hmm. is is creating like this terrible incentive. And what is it driving? What is driving this too? Could it be that more students are applying to A and M and UT because previously you're thinking, well, no one's going to take me because I have such a low class oh, rank. Oh yeah, you that's know, another. Now I think I'm going to go ahead and throw this out. That's there. a that's another interesting hypothesis yeah. that it's just affecting. Students' perception of you know what their chances are, making them feel more confident. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, somebody should really look into that. That's that's pretty fascinating. Well, maybe these people do. We could uh, send them an email, and maybe they want to participate at some point and mm -hmm. tell us a few things about how we can uh, improve. Let's well, let's say make the transition into college a little bit more. Uh, useful, pleasant, uh, enticing to students that don't think they're college material. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so uh, what about, uh, what's the other story we're going to dive into? Well, we had that 1836. Let, let's talk a little bit about that, okay, if you're so, interested in it. So what do you mean by 1836? Because this graphic looks like old typewriter writing from the 70s that or is what <laughs> That is what uh, statutory code in the state of Texas, what it looks like. Is it a requirement to use that font? I, I want to know. You know what? That's this a was great probably question. made on a computer, but we got to use typewriter it's, it's font. What, it's, it's, it's what exists. If you, all right, there's a, Texas is really good in terms of uh, the avail availability of information related to um, legislation, constitutional issues, and all of that. You know, you are just a handful of clicks away from anything in the Texas Constitution, anything in Texas statutory code which is pretty cool. And everything has this this particular look to it. I guess, what is this, Times New Roman? No, no. No, what is this it? A, this is not real font. And I, I don't know how yeah. I ended up doing research about fonts, but, um, <laughs> and typewriters, I mean, old school typewriting, they had to be a space around each of those letters. That's why it looks like there's all those gaps between yeah. those letters. Yeah. And then what real fonts are that they use nowadays is that the position of one letter um, is adjusted, it's sort of optimized depending on what letter is next to it. Okay. Uh, so, because there are a variety of letters that when they're put next to each other kind of blend and then maybe, um, and then two letters might look What's like the something name of else. That? It's like kerneling, something like that. Oh, you know, how you like a N, like an the... N and an R might look like an M. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's what made Steve Jobs um, one of the things I was going to mention Steve Jobs. That's what he studied, right? Well, Calligraphy? Yeah, exactly. And so when he came up with the Apple computer, yeah. one of his big contributions really was he hated the sort of the typewriter type fonts yeah. that the PCs were using. And yeah. so and his goal was to create, you know, beautiful, you know, calligra calligraphic <laughs> fonts uh, that are sort of optimal. Um, well, this ain't beautiful. But, but it's, it's, uh, it's clear. It looks serious. All right. So what is this? Um, what is this telling us? Well, here? here's here's some of the background, and uh, I could add a few things. You know, perhaps later on if we want to dig into this a little bit more. But clearly, this is a response to the 1619 project, which was an effort by uh, different individuals. I think promoted by the New York Times. Uh, to look at uh, the history of slavery, of enslavement, of bringing an African labor force into the, uh, the colonies, development of the slave codes. And, of course, it's not just, you know, here. It's a, a lot of the – my understanding is to Barbados, places like that. That's where a lot of the code actually – uh, developed and, of course, is, you know, brought up to Virginia and whatnot and the evolution of this over the course of time. I, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the 1619 project. I've yet to really dig into it. But obviously the 1836 project, 1836 being the year that Texas be, uh, be, achieved its independence from Mexico, began its attempt to be an independent nation for about a, what, nine-year period of time before it became a state. So it's 1836. So all, the, all this... Texas knowledge I, I need to learn um, but everyone needs to learn <laughs> well driving around I noticed <laughs> that there are statues everywhere and then I could read some plaque and then learn but before we go to the 1836 project which is sort of the Texas founding can you give us some background on what is the 16 is it 1619 1619 well I mean as I, I just mentioned I mean that's that's probably the most that needs to be said right now it's just an under what, what is that year supposed to represent that was now it's a little bit controversial. 1619 is when the first boatload 
of Africans came into, I right. believe, Virginia. I may be wrong. Now, it's an interesting period of time, too. I'm aware of some interesting controversies or court cases that happened in the 1640s. Uh, my understanding is initially, and again, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I, I can't claim to be an expert, uh, but I have, a, I think, a pretty good familiarity. But everyone is kind of an indentured servant at that period of time. As of yet, you didn't have a permanent enslavement. But there were some court cases involving uh, three indentured servants who escaped, I think, from Virginia into Maryland. They're eventually caught. Two were European. One was African. The two Europeans were punished by giving uh, like another two or three years on their indenture. Mm. I think that's how you would uh, refer to it. The African was made a permanent uh, indentured servant, in other words, enslaved. And so oh, wow. apparently that is what began that process. This is in the 1640s. So well, 1619 uh, would be when that particular. Let me let me look this up real quick. Uh, that's what's <laughs> well, I mean, if, if that's true, that's actually that's something new. Like I, I always thought mm -hmm. um, that Africans were brought over with the specific intent of this person is a slave. And then what, what you just said is that they came over as, quote unquote, indentured servants, which presumably has a time limit. It develops then, over the course of time. Yeah. And uh, then something happened yeah. um, that they switched it to this person will be a slave. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons associated with this. Anyway, the, uh, the, the, the boat apparently was the White Lion. A, an English privateer operating under a Dutch letter of mark, which brought the first Africans to the English colony of Virginia in 1619. That's why 1619. A year before the arrival of the Mayflower in New England, though the because remember Jamestown is about 11 years older than uh, Plymouth. Jamestown is actually where everything kind of began, the Virginia colony. Uh, though the African captives were sold as indentured servants, the event is regarded as the start of slavery of Africans in colonial North America. And again, it, it takes a little time, you know. Mm. I mean, okay. There's there's no there, oh, there's no real government to speak of at that period of time. Okay. You know, everything is still pretty. Uh, Pretty much evolving, but getting into the uh, the sixteen, um, I'm sorry, the eighteen thirty six project. So, so apparently, some people didn't didn't like this. Um, and uh, what is this bill? Well, this to? is a way for let's say the Texas legislature to encourage. I'm trying. I have too many tabs that are open right here. Wait a minute. This says executive branch. So wait, is this yes. like an order or is this a, a proposal? Well, a legal proposal. All right. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about government code. That is a part of the statutory code in the state of Texas, and it gives you a little bit more detailed law in how the judiciary branch is designed, how the legislative branch operates, is designed and operate, uh, beyond what you would see in the Constitution, and also how the executive branch operates. Now, that applies to us because we're part of the executive branch. We're enforcing, implementing state law. State says you've got to take this stuff. We create the institution, the, um, this, this institution is created to enforce that, implement that. In my case, you know, since I teach government, um, you know, what I teach is actually required by, it's in the core curriculum. Uh, so this is an attempt to try to influence that. Now, again, this is primarily oriented towards uh, K through 12. Um, but let's kind of understand a little bit about okay. what's going on here. It starts off by defining it. 1836 project means the advisory committee established under this chapter. All right, so it's an advisory committee. Uh, patriotic education includes the presentation of the history of this state's founding and foundational principles, examination of how the state has grown closer to those principles throughout its history, which is sort of interesting, kind of admitting in a way that, well, maybe we don't okay, yeah. match up to everything, mm -hmm. but we're, we'll get there. Don't yeah. worry. You know, I'm working on it. Okay. You know, it's kind of like, you know, summer's coming up in about four months. You know, I want to get ready for, uh, you know, beach. Beach uh, you know, body. Yeah, ready. beach body. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working closer to the principles of having the beach body. Okay. Explanation of why commitment to those principles is beneficial and justified. Hmm. State agency means, we are state agency, by the way, means a department, commission, board, office, or other agency in the executive branch of the state government that's created by the Constitution or a statute of the state. And again, like I said, that's us. And if you notice the dates, you know, it mentions, too, all of these acts right there from 2021. I think that was, what, about a year ago? Uh, 87th meeting of the legislature. RS means regular session. Chapter 818, I'm not exactly. HB 2492. And you notice it's hyperlinked. So you can go to the Texas legislature online and you can see the process by which this particular piece of legislation was passed. 
and it says effective September 1st, 2021, which is generally how mm. law works in the state okay, of Texas. You have about 90 days, but it's usually that September, September 1st of that same year. Yeah, um, and so, yeah, it goes into a little bit more detail associated with this. So an advisory committee to promote patriotic education and increase awareness of the Texas values that continue to stimulate boundless prosperity uh, across this state. That's, um, it's fascinating because every time I think of the word patriotic, I think of national. <laughs> well, welcome to Texas, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Texas uh, as it has its uh, different sort of... You, um, Texas seem to have like a conscious pride. I think Californians have a subconscious pride, which is interpreted as a sort of cockiness or what's another word, smugness, or more negative. <laughs> it's like just the belief that we're, we don't really have to say it, I guess. Uh, I, that's just we like to say vibe. it here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if not, we like to... Uh, there you aren't know. too many... Calif I don't see too many California flags. Uh, for some, I see the most no, flags no, in, no. in Texas for some reason. Do they fly California flags in uh, public schools? Oh, yeah. I okay. mean, on the okay. flagpole. Okay. But I, I just don't see them on, on cars or outside of people's houses. Or Is there a Pledge of Allegiance to, to California? California? No. That, the first time I remember teaching here at Alvin, I mean, like, First of all, I haven't heard the Pledge of Allegiance in, in decades. I'm like, I and hope I remember a, this. It's a big thing. This is crazy. Yeah. People are just they're like, this is like, I'm back to being a child. And then I'm like, okay, we're done. And they're like, now onto the Texas Pledge of Allegiance. Like, yes. Whoa. Yes. Is this real? <laughs> Texas, we pledge. I was thinking at uh, one class, I was, every once in a while, I like to encourage individuals to like get involved in some kind of civic action. I'm kind of like, we need to have like some kind of pledge to Alvin, the city of Alvin. Or maybe oh, wow. Perlin or something like that. You know, we could all like dress, you know, it, it could be a Nolan Ryan thing. You know, I'm not really sure. Um, but no, this is, an this, is, this is an interesting thing. A kind of a controversial thing also in terms of, uh, you know, what education is supposed to do. Here's, here's the duties. This is, this is section 451.003. The 1836 project shall promote awareness among residents of the state of the following as they relate to the history of prosperity and democratic freedom in this state. Texas history, including the indigenous peoples of this state, the Spanish and Mexican heritage of the state, Tejanos, the African-American heritage of the state, the Texas War for Independence, Juneteenth, annexation of Texas by the United States, the Christian heritage of the state, and the state's heritage of keeping and bearing firearms in the defense of life and liberty and for use in hunting. So it's interesting the particular things that are kind of, mm -hmm. you know, thrown out here, you know. But again, we like the idea of... Uh, promoting that. Now, this is what I thought was especially interesting, especially considering some of the ongoing controversies on the national level in terms of voting rights. It mentions, all right, so uh, founding documents of the state, which I'm big on. I love looking at founding documents on the national and the state level. Founders of the state, state civics. This one, uh, the role of this state in passing and reauthorizing the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965, and it mentions the, the appropriate code, 52 U.S. Code Section 10101, highlighting President Lin Texas, Texan, President Lyndon B. Johnson signing the act, Texas, President George W. Bush, 25-year extension of the act, Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, successful efforts to broaden the act to include Spanish-speaking communities. Um, it's interesting because you got a lot of folks in Texas right now that are a little bit... Uh, reluctant to continue to strengthen that because some time ago the uh, uh, Supreme Court, in a case we might want to get into at some point, Shelby versus Holder, weakened this uh, by saying that the standards for review of particular states were out of date and they have to be replaced by Congress. And if you hear on the news anything related to the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, that would replace it. But you have a lot of individuals that don't want that pass. And there are also a lot of folks in Texas that are doing this. And it's, I just find it fascinating that they're highlighting support of the Voting Rights Act in this particular piece of legislation. But you have some folks that don't really necessarily seem like they want to uh, extend it for whatever reason. Um, this, OK, so basically this is saying this is Texas saying, hey, look, there's good things we've done. Right. I mean, that's that's what it seems to be saying, like, let's highlight the good things of the state. And of course, what good is, is there's yeah. some implicit, okay, so implicitly they're saying the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was a good thing, right? That's Seems what, it, they're right? bragging I mean, on if, it. If they're, gonna, if they're gonna be highlighting their role in it, uh, presumably um, that, that's good. Uh, what else does this do? 
let's see, hold on, let's look at this. Because I just, uh, we opened this up in a previous class, so a lot of this stuff is kind of brand new to me. But that's what I like about teaching, by the way. I'm always learning new stuff. Well, figure, uh, putting people up on a board that reviews this mm -hmm. and puts out suggestions for how to, in fact, actually promote this appreciation of Texas history. Uh, advise the governor on the core principles of the founding of the state and how the principles further enrich the lives of residents, facilitate the development and implementation of the gubernatorial 1836 award to recognize student knowledge of Texas independence and other items listed in subdivisions. It just, in sub, uh, I'm sorry, subdivisions one, A through D, and I guess that's what we just covered uh, just a second ago. So just to promote a particular sort of positive attitude of the state. It also mentions funding, uh, where the money comes from. A pamphlet, no later than September 1st, 2022, the 1836 project shall provide a pamphlet to the Texas Department of Public Safety that explains the significance of policy decisions made by the state that promote liberty and freedom for businesses and families. I don't know why the Texas Department of Public Safety, maybe when you go in to redo your license or something, here's your pamphlet. Let's learn a few things about Texas. Overview of Texas history and civics, legacy of economic prosperity, uh, and whatnot, so, and a report, not later than September 1st, 2022, the 1836 uh, project shall prepare and produce a written report that includes description of the activities of the project. In other words, follow up. What, in fact, actually did you do to enforce this? Do you think this could be followed up on? I mean, actually implemented in a way that's balanced, that doesn't, um, I mean, whatever that means, um, I mean, what's what's your take on this? I mean, I is it possible to cover question. these things without creating, you know, ignoring other things that may? Is it possible to talk about the good and the bad Pros of Texas? Um, I mean, this doesn't seem to say. Well, this particular bill is it saying don't talk about X, Y, and Z? Well, it seems like it very subtly does when I'm backing up a little bit, explanation of, da, 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 da. Ex examination of how the state has grown closer to those principles throughout its history. So maybe that's a, you know, a very subtle statement of the idea that we've got. Oh, founding okay, and that's good. Where, where is that? That's actually, that that's, is that's up, key. Up towards the, that's the, at the beginning. The second? Yeah, yeah, that's really oh, close. Right at the beginning, right at where the you said, right. um, what is okay. patriotic education? Okay, so kind of, you know. we need to highlight how we've moved closer to certain ideals. Okay, yes. so that, that does basically, you know, there, there is a requirement to at least emphasize or to at least bring up, right? That we yes. move close there. Yeah, there is a conclusion being made that we've moved closer and not further away. I suppose, again, implicitly that suggests that, okay, maybe there's certain things that have made it difficult for the state to achieve those. And maybe you discuss what those things happen to be. Um, and does it, and it stated what the principles are, like moving closer to the principles, is that, um, where was the list of those principles? Of, um, somebody says, what are the principles that we've moved closer towards? Like, what are those supposed to be? I guess we're supposed to figure that out. And you know, what's interesting is I'm reading through this, I don't see anything where it says, well, it says state agencies, you know, have to be part of this, or but it doesn't specifically, t and public knowledge, Patriotic education makes you think about schools, but I don't see anything specific about that. Put together this pamphlet that is available to the Texas Department of Public Safety. I don't know. Maybe they pull you over, give you a ticket, and they give you a pamphlet. Hmm. You know. Okay. Well, it looks like um, devil's going to be in the detail, but also in how you know who's going to implement this. Because I always, I always try to look for wiggle room. Like, if someone doesn't like this, what? How much room do they have to maneuver here? And it seems like, you know, they would, if, if there's a requirement, you must talk about the history and someone yes. would be like, yeah, I'm going to talk about the history and sort of not make it look good. Yeah. Um, if, if the people in charge of implementing this aren't true believers, you know, how, how much state does the power actually have, right? You know, that's, that's implementation, right? Here, let me let me read this because I suddenly saw that uh, Texas okay. Education Agency and then is we, mentioned. All right, and then uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up soon. The Texas Education Agency shall make a report described by this section available to the public on the agency's internet website. To the extent existing agency resources are available for this purpose, the Texas Education Agency may provide to the 1836 project any agency resources necessary to prepare or produce a report described in this section. So yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens with this. You know, stuff has to happen by this September first of this year. So, we'll see something. All right. Yeah. Let's keep an eye on that, and I wonder. I wonder what. Um, 
what sort of other news stories will spring from uh, attempting to implement this or undermine it, and we'll see what happens. We will. All righty, that's it for us. Uh, we're 635, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.